Welcome everybody to session number two of the May Digital Health Virtual Program. We will get started in just a couple of minutes. Thank you. Welcome everyone back to the second session of our May Digital Health Virtual Program. We're gonna to look to get started in just about 30 seconds. We wanna give you all plenty of time to file in here. Um, so I'll be back on in about 30 seconds to kick things off. Thanks again for joining us. Okay, welcome back everyone to the May Digital Health Virtual Program, Securing Your Digital Future. It is now time for our second session of the day, developing a robust identity access and governance program. We want to thank Ping Identity for their support with this session. In case you missed our first session of the day, I wanted to mention that we welcome questions for our panelists today. They are ready for them. And you can submit your questions using the chat box within the Zoom platform. All of these sessions will be made available on demand by the end of the day today, so you can consume this content whenever your schedule allows it. Following this discussion, we will have another one hour break before we host a fireside chat on securing your digital future. Okay, with that said, I would love to once again welcome back our Editor-in-Chief, Mark Haglin, who will be moderating uh, our second session. Mark? Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you all uh, in our audience for joining us again and staying with us. Uh, as those of you who were with us earlier uh, heard, we had a very engaged and engaging uh, discussion earlier on some overall security issues. And what we'd like to do now is really plunge into identity access management and governance uh, with our two esteemed panelists, Mark Eccleston and Aubrey Turner. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to ask each panelist to briefly describe himself, his role and his organization, 
in connection to this uh, topic, and then we will plunge in. Uh, Mark, would you like to go ahead, please? Sure. Thank you, Mark. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invite. Uh, I serve as Health Partners Plans, a regional leading HMO payer organization that has Medicaid, Medicare, and Children's Health Insurance in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, serve as both CISO, privacy official, and also manage a lot of the corporate services function as well. So happy to talk about identity and access management, one of the wonderful tools of security that actually can delight your users as opposed to many other security technologies. So excited to talk about that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. Aubrey, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I uh, really appreciate the invitation to be here with everyone uh, this afternoon. Again, my name is Aubrey Turner. Uh, by title, I'm an executive advisor at Ping Identity. Now, what that functionally means is I help our customers and prospects uh, around strategic alignment, uh, directionally where their identity program is headed, how it aligns to uh, not only ping solutions, but uh, the overall identity ecosystem. So some of the other pillars within identity, how things like zero trust affect them, how regulations, um, what others are doing, how they can be successful from an identity access management perspective um, and a host of other things, uh, sort of uh, a utility player, so to speak. Uh, so again, happy to be here, happy to be part of this conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Audrey. Aubrey, we really appreciate it. Um, Mark and Aubrey, let me begin by doing a little bit of a level set. Um, I'm going to reference the pandemic because um, as we all know, when the pandemic hit, uh, the leaders of patient care organizations had to move as many uh, things as possible, both patient care delivery and operations to remote to the extent possible. Now, obviously it was never possible to be 100% remote and that will never happen. But um, it was amazing how uh, in some organizations, uh, patient visits, meaning non-hospitalizations uh, non uh, went as much as 80% remote early last spring. So that was considerable. And for the same reasons that um, we wanted to try to prevent the spread of infection uh, in patient care delivery, operations went remote to the extent possible very quickly. And what we heard uh, in our reporting, I and my fellow editors on my team, was that it was a bit of a mad scramble, understandably, and everyone understood why. Um, later on, people went back and said, well, now we have to figure out how to make sure that we're on secure platforms. And um, a classic example that was brought forward to me by a consultant it was uh, a doctor sitting in their home office and their seven-year-old decides to run in and try to play with their laptop, right? And there, there was a lot, or another example that was brought to me, you know, uh, people were setting up their home offices right next to their Alexas. So weirdly enough, you know, uh, actual sensitive data might be captured through the Alexa device. So a lot was going on. And at the same time, uh, even before the pandemic, identity access management was evolving forward rapidly. So we had a very um, uh, flexible or uh, moving landscape. And at the same time, of course, the uh, threat vectors are only intensifying. Um, I referenced in our first panel, the attack that it was concluded that the Russian government was behind in which they actually disabled some hospital EHRs, um, at least for a short while. And the difference between the previous ransomware-based attacks and this one was they actually were trying to take out the systems they, and they actually put uh, organizations offline. So all that happening, there's a lot happening right now. Let's talk about what identity access management means right now in May 2021, what the landscape looks like to you and what some of the biggest challenges are. Let me start with you, Mark, and then we'll go to Aubrey. But based on what I've just shared, you can kind of take that in any direction and I, I might channel you a little bit after you've responded. Sure. So Mark, as I understand the question, you know, what are some of the big challenges given a pandemic and continuing security operations? Yeah, and how you see the landscape around identity access management in general 
including right. that element for context. Sure. Um, so, you know, it, it's something I've spoken about um, often in other presentations, but, uh, you know, part of my role is business continuity and uh, disaster recovery. So thankfully, we had uh, various teams that really helped us recover um, with very little additional expense. I think we upped some of our bandwidth as a precautionary measure, um, but we already had a very diverse technology stack for people connecting to us. So people connect through VDI, virtual desktop infrastructure, laptops, and even their own personal uh, machines. So all those things came into play. Uh, we had have had MFA in place, multi-factor authentication for over a decade, which is an essential uh, control. <laughs> if you get anything out of today's presentation, please make sure you have MFA for any external access coming in. Um, so things like that really, really helped us. Um, I think some of the things that were challenging is what you alluded to earlier, Mark. How do you handle, like in, behind me, I have a very open office concept. So it was setting uh, standards with my three children who have been homeschooling too. You know, what that yeah. means, that has the headphones on, you know, and, and trying to make the best out of the situation. So those are a lot of those other challenges. And of course, giving guidance out to our entire company about what decisions were made at the executive level and how we're going to do things if there was anything challenging. But, you know, lo and behold, like, like many organizations, we found out, wow, we can be 99.9% .9 remote and, and, you know, be highly successful. We did major migrations over the past years, developed and rolled out new applications, et cetera, and so forth. So it's been an amazing time to be in technology and resiliency. All those plans that we put together over the last year worked. We had an executive team and a crisis management team um, and another team that helped uh, manage the directives of the organization. And we had regular meetings and lo and behold, we stopped those after a while because things just seemed to work. From an identity and access management, the other part of your question, I think where it's really, really important is to start adopting, you know, and I hate to be, use the buzzword, but a zero trust architecture. You understand and that your people are going to be accessing their applications from anywhere, anytime, and that, you know, you can't push out the proverbial castle and moat architecture of security and expect that to work in today's cloud environment, in today's hybrid environment, which we all know as we approach the fall, hybrid is here to stay. Will people fail at it? Yes. Will people thrive at it? I certainly hope so, but you can expect that most companies will offer some level of hybrid options to most employees for the foreseeable future. And you've got to be able to look at controlling access on things such as their identity, such as where they're coming in from, and all those other things that are wrapped up into zero trust architecture. Um, so yeah, hoping to talk about some of these things today. Thank you, Mark. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, Aubrey, you uh, have a wonderful national approach because you're uh, interacting with people from across the country and across the health healthcare system. How do you see this right now? What if you, you know, what's your elevator speech for what our landscape is right now around identity access management, especially in May 2021, after we've gone through kind of the craziness of the pandemic and a lot of moving parts and increasing or intensifying intensifying threat factors. Yeah, so, uh, you know, great, great question. I'll, and I'll tag on to some of the things that sort of Mark uh, spoke about. Um, certainly, you know, um, the pandemic pandemic forced us to make a lot of quick changes and some of the adaptations that, that we've made we're, we're, we're not going back, right? So some of that, the, the, the proverbial, you know, um, can't put the toothpaste back in the tube kind of thing, right? So some of those changes, uh, you know, we've made. Uh, are just going to stick. Um, digital transformation, you know, we talked a lot about that pre-pandemic. Uh, the, the pandemic, I think, accelerated a lot of that. A lot of the development that was occurring um, as part of those transformation projects was occurring outside of the core network already. So, you know, a lot of that was going on in cloud. So you introduced that as a, as a risk and a, and a vector, right? So that accelerated. Um, certainly the work from home, you know, you send all these people home. Uh, you may have had to grant people new access. How did you track and ensure that um, that access was appropriate for their job? Um, so a lot of those uh, sort of changing changes happening sort of all at the same time. I think, uh, you know, my perspective on identity and healthcare, uh, you know, uh, you know, I was around at kind of some of the start of some of the sort of the initial identity access management solutions. I think 
healthcare was slow to sort of adopt some of those solutions in contrast to uh, maybe another regulated industry like banking. Uh, but I think the pandemic, and even before the pandemic, right, a brighter light was being shined on identity access management because as, and we had a false sense of security around the sort of four walls of the building that we went to and that castle and moat um, architecture that Mark referenced, it wasn't necessary. it wasn't really secure to begin with, but we had a false sense of security because we thought we could control the security as the users went into that building. So as users no longer go to that building, and again, with, even if they're in a hybrid, identity becomes the one element that you need to have to control. Uh, a lot of things that I, you know, ascribe to and talk about is, you know, an identity centric um, zero trust approach where identity is that sort of kind of ring zero. It is the, it is kind of where you start building the foundation from a zero trust perspective. Uh, not, a, not everyone may agree with that, but again, I, I feel, you know, uh, zero trust without identity is suboptimal for some of the reasons that I've already spoken about, right? Um, you, the, the, you can't go to the security anymore. So the identity needs to travel with the, the security needs to travel with the identity, excuse me. So that's why, again, I think zero trust has just kind of become the security ethos for this generation of, of cyber um, post pandemic. It will continue. And again, um, kind of looking at your cybersecurity program through that identity lens has gotten more and more uh, important to, to, to do that and take that approach. So I think those are some of the things that kind of wrapped up. And, and the last thing I'll say on that on this front is that, again, I think healthcare um, adoption of identity access management within healthcare has certainly accelerated. I think some of the challenges that I ran into, you know, five years ago is those EHRs were uh, proprietary systems, right? They were closed off. So integrating an identity access management solution with them was could be complex, right? Uh, you couldn't have deep integration. Um, so that was one of the sort of technical challenges. I think those systems have become more open. Uh, we found ways to integrate with them. So uh, I think from a healthcare perspective, uh, again, for those factors that you've cited, digital transformation, um, move to cloud, accelerating, work from home, all these things are sort of factors that sort of, sort of shifted um, shifted the, the security landscape and, and how we need to protect users. So I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll stop there because I, I know I've kind of said a lot, but those are kind of some of the things I've seen in the past and kind of where we are now. Right, very important points. I'm gonna, I agree with what both of you have said 100%. What are the biggest challenges to creating a zero trust based architecture and identity access management program that works in healthcare. And I say that because as we all know, healthcare is almost unique in terms of the porosity of identity and in terms of the porosity of contacts inside and outside of the system. I, I, um, I referenced this earlier this morning, but um, a few years ago, I interviewed a, a consultant who were, was in cybersecurity in three areas, healthcare, uh, financial services, and the nuclear power industry. And I was kind of fascinated that she was in nuclear power. And I said, well, what is the difference between nuclear power and healthcare when it comes to cybersecurity? And she said, well, in nuclear power, you, none of us could ever figure out how to reach through email someone working in a nuclear power plant, right? But hospitals and health systems are so easy. All you have to do is call up you know, call the purchasing department and say, oh, you know, I had some kind of problem with something, who can I speak to? And they'll say, well, you need to speak to Dottie. So now you have Dottie on the line and you say, oh, Dottie, I just have a question. Can you give me your email address? And then you do a phishing email to Dottie and you break in and there you go. Well, you can't do that with a nuclear power plant. You can't just, there are no numbers in the yellow pages for calling the nuclear power plants. So we're always going to have that unique set of vulnerabilities. What are the biggest challenges and how do we overcome them for, for both of you to respond to in creating that zero trust architecture based uh, program that in, incorporates uh, strong identity access management? Mark, do you want to go and then Aubrey? Sure, sure, thanks Mark. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges for our organization and perhaps 
every other payer out there, maybe the providers as well, is CMS interoperability rule compliance. Um, you know, ha haven't talked about that, and more again, it's more healthcare centric. But you know, July first, any member needs to come to us and say, "Hey, here's my phone. I want to get my clinical care data. I want to get my provider network information, and be able to have meaningful conversations. And I need it now and quickly." And so that rule's taking effect here. And so, you know, it's, it's integrating the OAuth standards. So you're gonna be able to have to leverage that and, and make sure that people uh, get prompt access. And, you know- Is we, that creating a bit of a panic? Ah, uh, wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> to be honest, it's just the three of us. So, so I've learned to use different words. Let's call them euphemism. I would say not maybe a panic mark, but maybe an opportunity or an excitement <laughs> of rush for get making sure we exceed our membership's expectations here. That sounds so, very yes. Taoist. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It is. It is. So, yes, yeah, so those are the kind of things that we're working with. You know, it, you, it requires some uh, partnerships with some, some great vendors, which we have, uh, that sense the same urgency agency that we do. Um, and, you know, I think it's probably going to impact commercial plans a little bit more yeah. than it is plans of uh, the three lines of business that we have. But nonetheless, we're going to be ready and be working with our membership to make sure that we're promoting this and, and really leveraging it because it's a significant investment to build a clinical data repository with all this data and make sure that people can, you know, connect to the API hanging off your website securely and promptly. And, you know, by the way, my team's also looking at this and going to be advising memberships or excuse me, our consumers, uh, what apps might be secure and which apps wouldn't be secure, but we aren't allowed to do information blocking. So CMS has really taken a completely different stance, in my view, than the age old HIPAA standards. They're now saying it's not a covered entity's risk decision. It's, you know, educate your consumers. If they want to use an unsecure or insecure app, let them. And long as long as it doesn't actually cause harm to your other membership. And that's a different way of looking. But from my review of the rule, that's really exactly what it's saying. So that's a big challenge. You know, other challenges uh, to get to the other part of your question, uh, Mark. Um, I think what, what I'd like to see out there working with many, many different vendors is the SSO and federation capabilities get more mature. Um, I believe that when we buy a software as a service app, we will continue to buy more of them and we will continue to change them out more frequently. That's just a byproduct of going to the cloud and the, and the, uh, cap, the efficiencies that come with that. I would rather not pay a fee for every time that I need to do federation or single, or single sign on. I believe that's cost of doing business. There are uh, websites out there like the SSO Wall of Shame that actually calls out the vendors that are calling these things. And the reason I say that is because we have our own federation um, active directory. We can leverage that. If we're doing that, what is the cost of integration with these vendors? So that's something I'd like to see a challenge addressed in the organization. Uh, you know, we're trying to work on that internally ourselves by getting in at the ground floor before any contract ink dries. I always find it easier to negotiate these things while in that process versus after the contract is signed. Um, I think the other piece that we're looking for too is just very, especially in healthcare, when you have some smaller organization, ma and pa organizations, if you will, they may not have the same level of APIs that a more robust, back to your example of an electronic health record might. So, you know, we have to make our identity and access management program work with a diverse group of vendors, some very robust standards and others very little API exposures for us to see and link into. Um, and you know, it, the, the challenges with all this too is just the uh, pace of the cloud and pace uh, since the pandemic. Things are moving much faster. You know, there used to be a time when we'd look in an app, uh, I don't do it anymore, but I have signed a five-year deal before. I really hesitate on three-year deals, but we're, re we're reviewing a lot of these applications on an annual basis, and we may choose to migrate away from them. When you do that, you really have to look at your IEM standards, the provisioning, deprovisioning, vendor check. Uh, the, the federation, which typically is the lightest load, but all those little things add up, and it creates more work for your internal team. So those are some of the challenges that we're grappling with. That's a lot of challenges. Um, Aubrey, Mark has shared a lot of thoughts. There. That was a, I love that. That was a very dense uh, brain dump for us. Uh, what your responses and anything you'd like to add in terms of what some of the core challenges are right now? Yeah, Mark certainly, Mark certainly hit a lot of points there and yeah. I checked the SSO wall of shame to make sure Ping wasn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> I didn't understand. I didn't understand the context of it. 
uh, obviously, you know, I don't need to fully disclose this. Obviously, I work for King Identity. We have SSO um, as well as other um, solutions. So I, I just, while Mark was talking, I was like, Google. Better <laughs> Google, Google like, that. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I understand the context of what uh, Mark is talking about. But, but yeah, I, I think there are still some specific challenges in, in healthcare. As I referenced one of them, sort of the EHR um, you know, ability to, to integrate with those kind of things. And, and again, like I said, some of that has evolved, but even basically how clinicians work, right? Um, is talking to a, you know, a hospital, we're talking about password lists and some of the solutions out, out there might require a biometric, but you've got a clinician who's got a, a face mask on and, and, you know, their hands, they have gloves on. So uh, how do you solve that? So I think there still is some uniqueness to healthcare that isn't necessarily uh, the same as in other, um, other industries, but I'll, I'll draw to some likenesses, right? So the, the, the Cures Act that Mark talked about, which is again about transparency and um, API, API access, accessible patient data, uh, the interoperability and kind of consumerization of, of healthcare, essentially. Better healthcare through outcomes, right? That that's, or better healthcare outcomes through data sharing. That's what we're all after. Essentially, that's what Cures is, is intending to uh, drive. It's very similar to open banking, right? Which is, you know, sort of, if, if you're familiar with, with, with that, a, a regulation in the EU that, that speaks to those things, API access, transparency, appropriate access to data. So there's some similarities there. Um, that again, that are in healthcare. Um, I, I think, you know, um, being able to, and, and Mark, you know, spoke about single sign on, I think being able to centralize authentication, the directionally, that is one of the ways that we're headed and sort of being able to orchestrate the user journey. And, and again, at ping, we don't, whether it's a workforce, a partner, uh, uh a patient, uh, whatever the identity type, whatever the persona, right? Being able to orchestrate that that journey and provide a, a seamless, frictionless experience, right? Mm-hmm. I think um, trying to solve that challenge in in healthcare, I think, is is you know one of the things that certainly uh, our customers talk to us about. One of the things that we're working on helping them with, as well as uh, again, and whether. Cures, meeting cures is a byproduct of uh, some initiative that you're working on, or you have a specific cures initiative. Uh, certainly we see, you know, we're having conversations with, with customers around um, meeting cures. Um, I think the other, one of the other challenges, I think that I, I'll go back to that and, and I kind of want to reference this because it's, it's popped up in every sort of conversation, most healthcare conversations that, that I've had. And Mark alluded to this is the sort of multi-persona challenge, right? Um, especially at um, universities that have hospitals, you could have a, a human who has multiple personas. They could be faculty and admin, an actual clinician. So how do you solve that? How do you uh, manage those identities? How do you govern that identity? Um, obviously a lot of context is gonna be um, hyper important to the access that they have when they're functioning in one of those personas. So those are some of the, the, the challenges, again, uh, you know, working on sort of multiple angles to a lot of this stuff. But I'd say, I'd certainly say cures, right? And, and Mark spoke to that, um, the interoperability. That is probably one of the, uh, the biggest things right now in healthcare uh, and being able to, to tackle that so you don't get hit with seven figure um, seven figure fines um, once they start uh, looking at yeah. looking at this stuff, right? A- absolutely. Thank you, Aubrey. And I, I just want to uh, make a point for something that you said, Mark, which I agree with. I mean, so here's the really interesting thing. We've got different streams going in different directions in healthcare. On the one hand, for population health management, we, we need more information sent from more entities to more entities than ever before. We've also got this consumer empowerment, which was a huge thing um, uh, under the previous administration. It was something that Seema Verma stood, stood up at the HIMSS conference two years ago, talked about very passionately that this was gonna be a huge focus. But then on the other side of this, you've got these increasing intensifying cybersecurity uh, uh, threats 
So it's, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's a very complex thing to manage, right? Um, so what I'd like to ask is how, if you can both explain for our audience your perspectives on where identity access management fits into this issue, this set of issues around ransomware. Well, obviously we all know ransomware is bad. We know we need to try to block it. Does identity access management as a tool have a real role in uh, helping to minimize the phenomenon of ransomware intrusions. And I ask that knowing that um, there are many other elements involved in how ransomware gets in. Um, you know, as I, as I always say, it's like, you, you know, here is Dottie in the purchasing department and she gets this email saying, um, concerning issue regarding your FedEx package. And she says to herself, oh, I didn't know I had a FedEx package. So of course she clicks on the phishing email and then that opens up the ransomware. So there are many elements there that don't have to do with IAM, but um, how does IAM fit into that landscape? Uh, Mark, then Aubrey. Wow, um, <laughs> that is a big question. Let me try and summarize my random brain dump of thoughts going on here. So, so I think you have to define what I am is first, right? I, I am in my mind has rapidly expanded. It used to be I am was like single sign on, right? Um, but then I am became much more than that. It's B to C like uh, yeah. my co-panelist is doing or consumer I am. Um, it's MFA, it's privileged account or privileged identity management. Um, it's identity lifecycle management, such as entitlement reviews, provisioning, and deprovisioning. All these things are, are IAM technologies, right? But as it relates to ransomware and those type of threats, it's interesting you say that because I just sent out a Cyberbytes, one of the internal newsletters I sent out to our entire company to keep them abreast of these things. You know, I kind of rip a story from the headline and then talk about what this really means uh, across the industry and then how this really means for our company, Health Partners Plans. So one of the biggest things, and it irritates me so when I, when I hear about this, is get your MFA rolled out there. If you are allowing people to access your VPN or your web email and they just have to put in a password, please know that that will get stolen and is it easy. You are low bearing fruit for the, for the cyber criminals out there. You yeah. will, they will successfully trick your users, whether it be an impersonation email, uh, various phishing, you know, whale phishing, whatever you want to call it, um, a redirected URL, they will capture that information, they will abuse it, and then you'll have all the other things. I mean, we've had invoices from quote unquote our trusted partners and have come darn close to paying some of those things out for these type of things. So, you know, if our partners used MFA like we did, it would greatly reduce a lot of this stuff. But there's many, many more controls that, that do this too. Back to identity access management or entitlement reviews, we have a product that allows us to lock down the thousands, if not millions of folders we have out there. Uh, and, that, and that stops the east to west uh, movement of the ransomware. Typically when they come in and they you know, come in typically from email and another thing to have a secure email gateway, not really an IAM tool, but another robust security tool, they're then gonna come in, you're gonna trick the user, then they're gonna start spreading east to west. And if you have your unstructured data folders locked down, you're gonna really limit that. And we have a tool that allows us to do that as well as entitlement reviews. And of course, you know, identity lifecycle management allows you to do that across Across your unstructured data, like I just spoke of, but then your application. So if you limit to people having access to your treasure data, to only those who absolutely need it, you're going to really slow down, possibly even stop the spread of um, uh, ransomware occurring. So again, MFA and least privilege, those two things are not incredibly difficult to do in today's age. And if people did those with a little bit of sprinkling at Security Mill Gateway, I think you would see ransomware plummet. Great. Aubrey, your thoughts? Yeah, and I'm going to echo some things that Mark says because I think it's, it's, it's vital. It's incredibly important, right? So let me start with, again, whatever your security framework or methodology is. And again, like I said, I feel like zero trust is a security ethos right now. So let's start with that. Like we see it as a team, a team sport, right? Even though, like I said, I'm advocating and coming at it from an identity centric perspective. It's still, it's still a team sport. That means your endpoint, your network, your 
uh, MDM, your data, uh, all these things are sort of like, if you imagine if you built it like the OSI layer seven model, um, however you want to put it together, uh, again, just make sure sort of identity is, is, is relevant. And I'll, and I'll say this and, and I'll be absolutely as clear as I can. MFA and centralized authentication uh, via SSO are basically table stakes, mm -hmm. right? And Mark hit the nail on the head. If you are not doing MFA, you need to, as soon as this, wait until the webinar is done. <laughs> and then go. And then go or maybe not. MFA. <laughs> or maybe not. Um, and the reason, and, and, and I'm going to say something, and I know I'll probably, it's not that controversial, but you need to approach it from a, from a MFA everywhere, SSO everything. Those are the notions, those are the concepts as part of your zero trust strategy. And then you work from a, from a risk-based perspective to figure out where you need to deploy those things um, and, and where they make sense, right? So start with those things, MFA, all the things, SSO, everything, and, and, and work back from there. But I think MFA is key. I said also privilege access management I, I couldn't agree more with, with Mark. And, and I used to get a question and I still do like, Hey, Aubrey, if you're in my shoes and this answer hasn't changed, I've been on record with, with this, a customer's asked, say, if you're in my shoes, what are some of the things that you would focus on? And from a time to value and risk reduction perspective, SSO plus MFA plus privilege access management, I think lowers your risk profile um, a lot to where you can mitigate uh, things like ransomware. Uh, by the way, I love that Mark mentioned data access governance to stop that east-west stuff, right? Because oftentimes uh, these bad guys may be looking to lock up data or maybe disrupt service, right? Um, so from a data perspective, if you can use a data access governance solution to um, minimize access to that, to that, to that data, um, that's invaluable. But again, from a from a time to value risk reduction perspective, SSO, MFA, uh, and privilege access management are some of the sort of the key things that I would do uh, to, to mitigate um, you know, ransomware. Uh, so I, I, I'd start there and being able to leverage risk signals and inject some intelligence into the decision-making. I think it's where that, that's where that centralizing authentication services and having an adaptive risk-based um, MFA solution can help you make better decisions about whether Dottie uh, gets access uh, yeah, or not, or exactly. somebody who's impersonating Dottie, right, um, gets access. So those are those are some of the things, and I, I feel some of the um, some of the you know the smarter uh, identity teams are looking at at those things. And I'll and I'll end I'll end with this. I'll end this sort of session, this segment with with this. Um, I think understanding your risk and looking at your identity tool set, your stack. Right, and the maturity and building a roadmap um, is is key. So even if you already have some of these solutions, or if you don't, you need to hang up off this webinar and go buy an MFA tool and, and get that rolled out. I think you still at some point need to sit down, understand your risk, evaluate your tool set, what is their relative maturity, define a roadmap to go forward, and then ask yourself the time, money, and effort that you will spend. Um, working on the initiatives that are on that roadmap, what is that relative to the cost of paying a ransom, right? Uh, and again, I'm not going to pick on anybody, but we know of a recent situation where the ransom was $5 million. I'm willing to bet that the money that you will spend, the time and money and effort that you will spend on that risk analysis, whether you do it internally or engage a partner to help, right, is going to be less than what you will lay out for potential ransom. And I'll, I'll stop there. Um, but I think those are the sort of most essential sort of things that we can do as security practitioners and identity practitioners to help mitigate some of the ransomware. Great, great. I'm gonna ask each of you a question specific to each of your situations. Uh, I'll do Mark and then back to Aubrey. Mark, as the CISO at a provider-sponsored health plan. Are there specific issues that you have? Uh, are there advantages over other kinds of health plans or disadvantages? What does your world look like compared to those health plans that are not provider-sponsored? 
Yeah. Well, before I jump on that, I just want to give kudos to Aubrey's statement there earlier. It just mm -hmm. does not make sense to pay the ransom in the long term. I do understand as a business continuity professional and you're looking at time down and paying this, there are some times I wouldn't endorse it, but I could still see the rationality. But to Aubrey's point, if you look at the long term implication, the finances will never make sense. Doing these two couple things that we just talked about will always pay off in the end against ransomware. But yeah. back to the question with the payers, um, you know, or being, excuse me, a provider owned uh, hospital. It, it's really interesting in Philadelphia market, we are actually having, like in many markets, there's more M&A activities. So yeah. we are at a uh, very crucial time of change. Our um, One of our most dominant hospital owners, Jefferson Health System is poised to be our single owner later this year. So that's gonna create some more opportunities as far as software licensing, more integrations between technology. And a lot of this is still TBD and the how that's gonna impact us, but it's an exciting times ahead for those type of things. Now, um, as a, I, I'm gonna envision that a lot of the other payer HMO, um, excuse me, provider payer organizations probably are doing some of these things already with licensure things and identity as well. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if you had one, um, you know, identity repository for all your B2C connections? I mean, that is going to be a godsend. Even in our own world, we have had, we have some historical portals where we chose to have that identity managed with that vendor. And that's difficult to undo because although it can be done, you're going to inconvenience your consumer at some portion, whether they have to just click a separate link or they have to come up with a new password, there will be some inconvenience. So working with your provider uh, owners and getting that situation addressed as early as possible is going to help with all the additional rollouts you're going to do in any of the new acquisitions when it comes to portals, which in healthcare, they're here to stay, right? We're not gonna all we're we're not gonna ever probably have one single portal for all our providers and all our members. We're gonna have a couple different ones. That that the challenge is making sure that those different uh, uh, portal technologies are seamless to the consumer. And then one of the best ways to do that is to launch an identity service that gives you that true B2C environment where they just have one username, one password, or better yet, maybe a token and no passwords. Uh, there's a lot of nice technology coming out that's making a lot of this more real than it ever has been in the past. Well, that's good to know. Uh, thank you, Mark. Aubrey, the question, my question for you is, you know, your organization is involved in a lot of different industries. You're involved in financial services, retail, manufacturing, the public sector. What can healthcare learn from those other industries in this area? We often talk about healthcare as unique, and it is in many ways unique, uh, but obviously we can learn some things and we have historically been behind some of the other industries. What are a few of the top kind of marquee level things that you think healthcare can learn? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I'll, I'll, I'll take something from retail and I'll take something from banking because it's regulated. Uh, from the retail, if I could take something that I would bring to the healthcare side and, and Mark talked about this is the end user, the customer experience is king, right? Starting with that, trying to build frictionless experiences um, in terms of registration, even if you have multiple portals providing sort of a seamless single sign-on experience and, and ultimately passwordless uh, to eliminate, you know, passwords that are easily stolen, easily forgotten, right? So leveraging other factors, um, not only can increase the end user experience and have a more delightful end user experience, but also mm -hmm. increase security. Uh, on the workforce side, certainly productivity would be the, the flip side of that, that coin. So from retail, I, I would learn, if I was in healthcare, I would learn from retail how to drive uh, sort of more seamless, frictionless end user experiences. And, and oftentimes when we're talking to customers, the, the, the number one requirement these days, right, is this experience is the, the end user experience is the, is the driver and sort of all yeah. the other requirements will, will be towed along by, by that. So from retail, I would certainly uh, take that. On the banking side, as I mentioned earlier in, in the discussion, open banking has, has been around for, for some time now and, and there's some similar uh, themes, right? The API access, the um, data sharing and, and consent enforcement 
And so the banking industry has, has been, and again, specific to sort of the EU has been dealing with that. And, and, and to some respect here in the US as well, sort of leaning into that and sort of more forward, like imagine how you might elect to share certain data. Like I, I, have, a, I have a collective um, sort of view of my financial health right, um, through one of, um, through my financial advisor, I can pull pieces of data um, into that picture to give me a view of my financial health and my net worth, right? Mm -hmm. So with the, the, the Cures Act, uh, and again, uh, accessible patient data and empowering patients to drive better healthcare outcomes, that's gonna be part of that. So how do you uh, grant um, access dynamically to a caregiver to see, maybe they can see your appointments, but not certain test results, or maybe you want them to see those test results. So how do you do that dynamically and, and, and manage that contextually? Uh, certainly that's, that's part of, part of the, 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 the Cures Act. So learning and taking a little bit from sort of the financial industry, banking with open banking, I think are some sort of um, solid lessons learned mm -hmm. uh, that again, I think can sort of continue to help push identity uh, in healthcare. Uh, and again, drive better outcomes for patients because that's ultimately uh, what it's about. I like that very much. Thank you so much, Aubrey. Um, let's talk about governance. Um, what does governance mean in this specific context? context? And I kind of want to narrow it a little bit to, let's look at the element here of so many identities of so many people in so many pieces of so many organizations all moving around, right? Like I, I did a, w a webinar with people from an academic medical center and they were talking about how they, they have clinicians and this especially was true during the height or depth of the pandemic. They had nurses and physicians in different places, like they were literally moving them. They were going from clinic A to clinic B. They were going from hospital A to hospital B. Um, and they would have different identities. It, it gets so complex in healthcare, right? So what does governance look like? How do we, who needs to be in on that? Where, one of the things that always strikes me about cybersecurity is compared to other issues in healthcare, it's kind of set apart on its own shelf, right? Like the people who understand it tend to be specialists. It's seen as something kind of off over there to the side that is not, that's kind of different from everything else, all the other activities. So what does governance, what does governance look like? What does good governance look like? How do you get there? Uh, Mark, would you like to go in then Aubrey? Sure, why not? Um, so for me, wow, what is good governance? Well, I'm going to start by leveraging a quote from somebody you all have had here as well, Mr. Uh, Jim Rouse, an esteemed CISO uh, many people look up to, including myself. And he once was asked, how big is your security department? How many people? And he answered the exact number of the workforce in his company. So I think when I think of what governance is, that's when you know you've nailed it. Every CISO wants a culture of confidentiality to create that. But when you can truly say that every one of my workforce member is part of my security team, that's when you know you've hit the nail on the mark. And that's really what's so important here about data governance. You know, security, when they first, with HIPAA and whatnot, when it first came into it, you know, uh, business owners all the way up to executive levels, like, I don't know who has access to the system, ask the security guy, that's his job or her job. And that's simply just not the truth, right? You, you know, the mature identity lifecycle management will typically introduce these two terms, a data owner and a security administrator. Security administrator are the people that are connecting those users to spe specified roles and only doing so if they have authorization from a data owner. So I think that's one of the first steps and challenges to get out there. Um, um, you know, right away is making sure that for every app you have in your inventory, make sure you know who the security administrator, but more importantly, make sure you know who that data owner is. Those are the people that are going to do the ultimate sign off or entitlement reuse and things of that nature. If you get really good at this, you can challenge back with the data owner. I mean, data owners need to understand their role, that that's how they keep the integrity of the data in that system. Don't let people mucking with that data if they don't have the appropriate training. Don't let people, uh, you know, alter, destroy, change that data unless they, you know, have a right to do so and they have a role that's best to them to do so. Um, you know, we, we've had entitlement reviews where we have people come in and go, yeah, looks good, check, 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 check. Everybody gets access. 
hopefully your security department has the relationship to challenge rubber stamp processes like that, right? You want people. I mean, that's, that's an age-old security tenant found in HIPAA and anything else. And goes back to all many, so many things we've talked about so far today. You know, don't let people have access to any more data than they, than they need. Now, there's going to be times where people are going to need an entire medical record. Make sure you have rapid provisioning steps and rapid deprovisioning steps. And Identity and Lifecycle Manager can do that. You can now set these systems to say, okay, we're going to go ahead. We're going to open up, but just for 24 hours. And it automatically revokes that access after a certain predetermined time. You know, it really takes a, a village and having those base governance principles in place and role definements, you know, it's not as simple as like a, a RACI uh, or not as complex, excuse me, as a RACI matrix. It's really down to those two roles. Make sure you know who's going to be looking at the system issues and understanding how to create roles and provision. But more importantly, make sure you have that business owner that really understands their role in owning that application and making sure that only appropriate people have access to that. Uh, those are some of the key things I'd be looking for and have done. Oh, great. Thank you. Great advice. Aubrey, your thoughts, key elements, uh, critical success elements in uh, uh, establishing good governance? Yeah, so I think, and short of when, when I hear governance, I'm, I've been sort of conditioned to think, um, the you know, I, IG, identity governance and administration. And that G means the, the certification, accreditation of you know, user access. So whether it's front door access or sort of more deeper entitlement reviews, that's what I'm conditioned to immediately think of. Um, take that up a level in terms of the uh, governance of the actual identity access management program. Who owns it? Is there, is there an owner of the, the program? How are you handling sort of strategic initiatives and what does the operating model look like? So that, that layer of governance of the actual identity program itself and, and the business is constantly changing. So the program needs to keep moving and, and continually evolve with it as well. Um, I'm part of the IDSA, I sit on the board. Um, you know, we, we recently published a, a uh, blog about why your identity program is, is like, like a shark, right? Sharks, they, they, most of them never stop. They're always swimming, they're always moving. Um, feel free to uh, check that out. I think it's a great article that sums up sort of what governance looks like um, from a program perspective. But I also think, um, you know, good governance in this day and time, sort of the, the work from home thing and how you're sort of addressing that, uh, certainly lean into, lean into zero trust, if that makes sense for you. Lean into identity-centric zero trust. I think good governance is every user, every device, Every system app is authenticated and authorized. That's sort of the goal of governance to Mark's point and having accountability for all of that. Uh, I, think, I think enabling end users to uh, Mark's comment about that CISO and basically the force multiplier, his security team was the entire organization. Yeah. So incredibly sensible, right? That's, that's, it's so easy, but it's so brilliant at the same time. Yeah. So you have to enable end users and, and really the security needs to travel with identity again, because we're, we're not working in those sort of same four walls. And I think the key to enabling the end users is having organizational change management. Um, if you're not familiar, just Google organizational change management. There's several methodologies. I don't care which one you use. Use pick one, use one, right? And it's about how you drive adoption, how you understand the impact to an end user. If you're going to roll out passwordless, you should know that your clinicians can't use biometrics. They're, they're going to, and that's part of the impact analysis that you need to do. So you understand how users will react and, and whether they'll adopt because the best security for any, any of these tools is adoption, right? The more widespread it is and, and, and users will be more likely to use it if it's, if it's frictionless and sort of easy to use and sort of almost transparent. But that a lot of that is sort of organizational change management, messaging the how, the why, uh, and and what's what's happening, and again figuring out ways to drive end user adoption. Um, yeah. You know, those are some of the the kind of key things that I would sort of, you know, in response to your question about good governance. That's it. Start there. Yeah. And I, I absolutely agree with you, Aubrey. So much of this is change management and people management on a basic level. Yeah. Um, we have an audience question. Before we get to that question, I just wanted to ask you, Mark, um, can you share with us one or two 
nice breakthroughs that you've had of any kind that you would just like to share, you know, within the last year that you've been able to accomplish? Sure. Um, well, one of the things that we've done is we've matured our platform and yeah, the, the identity lifecycle management provisioning, deprovisioning tool we use is we've really solidified and empowered a very talented security engineer to own that platform. He goes out and sees what the roadmap is, talks about developments and works really hard to implement those things and has exceptional customer service. So this gentleman uh, was somebody who was just really excelling in the customer service role and making sure that he always closed the you know, greatest amount of, of help desk ticket. And here he is promoting himself into a security engineer role to own it. That's key, right? Because in security, we have a saying, it's all about people, process, and technology. And so many of us reverse that stack and go straight into technology. All starts with people. So empower somebody to really own this process in your org. Um, we also have another security engineer who has become incredibly talented to uh, link up the variety, the vast portfolio of software service apps. So having someone else who has a skill set and how to onboard um, uh, the federation techniques, given whatever the uh, provider has available, has been key. Those two roles are really, you know, I can't thank those two gentlemen enough for what they're doing for the identity and life cycle program at, at, at Health Partners Plans. Um, one of the things I'd like to say, too, is... You know, back to our other stance about MFA. Um, MFA, in my opinion, has become a commodity and is best integrated with other things. Now, I don't want to disenfranchise Aubrey. I'm drawing a distinction between MFA for your existing workforce and consumer identity access management or B2C. That's a whole other thing that I'm sure Aubrey can tell you a lot more about. But I think MFA for your workforce is a commodity and can best be integrated from several other partners doing lots of different things. Uh, and that's been something that we've moved to, and that's been very, very helpful to do savings. We went from three MFA providers uh, and are down to uh, almost one right now. Um, so that's been really, really helpful. Um, we also report out to our executive team and our quarterly reports, our roadmap for how many apps we're choosing to federate in the next quarter and how many we've federated that quarter. Because everybody knows when you click on an application and bada bing, bada boom, you're in that application, you don't have to type in a username and password, that saves time. And it also saves time from people calling your help desk to reset those things. So they get that and everybody loves that experience. So those are another challenge that we met by keeping people apprised of the cool stuff we're doing in IAM. Wonderful. I want to allow each of you time to make a summary statement at the end, but let's also uh, address this question. So we have a question from Dan Sewell. It's a, he says, when it comes to patients with healthcare across multiple organizations, how do you create trusted, trusted identity across multiple organizations? Who would like to address that? Mark, do you want to go first? Or do you want, you want me to tackle that? Aubrey, I'm thinking with your experience in working with multiple organizations, you yeah. might be primary on this one. Yeah, sure. So uh, cer certainly, again, uh, not knowing some of the specifics of this particular situation, um, we would uh, leverage, again, tools that, that we have that are in the marketplace, right? Single sign-on federation solutions and directory services uh, to create a, uh, a unified profile for those patients. Now, certainly I'd wanna understand, you know, are there limitations? And I mentioned some of the, the data sharing elements that we would need to uh, be concerned about in relation to cures and, and respecting uh, patient, um, you know, being able to honor their consent and, and manage their, their consent. But certainly on a very surface level of this particular question, uh, certainly, yeah, we've, we've done this, right? Sort of unifying the customer profile uh, across multiple organizations and then providing a way for uh, a patient to sort of have that frictionless access um, to the records that may exist in multiple places. Um, so that's essentially how we would uh, address that. Yeah, I, I, I could add very little, but yeah, my, my experience is more on legacy platforms. So creating like a trust and active directory is how yeah. we used to do it more now with more cloud based apps that that's not a very viable strategy forward. So making sure that you leverage a, a strong partner like Ping uh, to come in to help you really manage the disparate identities across disparate platforms and hopefully aggregate those. 
And that's something we, you know, as I mentioned earlier, when we take on a new portal, a new software as a service, we want to own that because we see identity as strategic, whether we own that ourselves or with a partner like Ping. Uh, I'm not in favor of continuing to have our, those identities managed by our software as a service or portal apps. We need to own that strategically. It's an asset because that's what's going to really help um, drive positive customer experience and digital innovation. You don't want people having more than one log on and don't want to have to put them through every time you change your identity provider. We are the IDP. Absolutely. Yeah. As, as, as Mark mentioned, just really, really quick, Mark, yeah. Mark H. Um, yes. You may end up in a scenario where you have uh, multiple portals, but it doesn't need to feel that way to the patient, to the end user. There are solutions out there, and again, Ping is, is, has been doing this for, for, for years and years, uh, connecting um, these disparate entities and, and unifying a profile, uh, particularly again with, with cures and some of the requirements, uh, the end user, the, the customer experience, end user experience being King, right, kind of thing. Uh, again, this is stuff that uh, Ping has been doing for, for years and years and years. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. So uh, we we literally have three minutes left. So I'm going to give you. Don't you love having to compress everything into one minute? I'm going to give each of you gentlemen one minute to share uh, ad, final advice for our audience. Things they based on everything we talked about. Quick, a couple few things that they should be doing. Mark. Sure. So in 60 seconds or less, you're not doing it now, like we said before, turn on MFA. Don't make your users type in like an eight digit security code token to if they can answer a phone call, if they can click that app on their phone, that's typically good enough for most folks, as long as you've done the identity proofing with that. Next, once you get past that, keep it going and help deliver or exceed your users' expectations. Give them a portal where they can request access to anything in the company and make sure that you have data owner authorization for any of those things that they access. Might sound crazy at first from an historical uh, security perspective, but exceed their expectations. Make IT easy to do business with and make sure that they can get that access. Get out of the way and, and enable their productivity. Hope that helps. Perfect. Aubrey. Yeah, just a few quick thoughts, and, and uh, this will be a recap of some of the other things that I've touched on. But I think look at your cybersecurity program through that identity lens, um, and taking take and assume you've been breached posture, right? That really equates to zero trust. We've we've got data out out there that says the sort of the majority of organizations are looking at or adopting some element of zero trust. And to be clear, zero trust is not a product; it is a framework use it as a guardrails for adjusting your cybersecurity program to the realities of today. Uh, I think, like I said, I think good governance, you know, one way to look at that is that, um, you know, every, about least privilege, right? It's about least privilege. So every user device system service is authenticated and authorized. Uh, and don't forget about or organizational change management. I think that is absolutely critical to the, su to the success of your identity access management program. I'll leave it at that. Perfect, both of you, thank you. I will just add one piece of advice from my standpoint. Um, based on our reporting and everything you, ge you gentlemen have said, uh, you have to continuously educate your board and your C-suite so they understand what's going on and that they can be true advocates for you. And then you have to uh, continuously educate your staff and your clinicians so they understand what this is about because you literally cannot afford to have your whole system come crashing down because of uh, outside criminals who want to keep uh, piercing our defenses. So uh, it'll be an ongoing challenge and the threat vectors are only intensifying. So I'm so glad we had this uh, discussion and Mark and Aubrey, you've just been terrific. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your insights. And Matt Rayner has magically reappeared. <laughs> thank you, Mark. And, and thank you panelists for the great conversation today. I also want to once again, thank our friends at Ping Identity for their support with this panel discussion. We now have another break. So feel free to stretch your legs, reply to some emails, grab something to eat or drink. Uh, we will come back online at 2 p.m. Eastern time for a fireside chat conversation on securing your digital future. We look forward to seeing you back on here shortly and thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very thank much. You have a great day. Pleasure.